Hey, this is John from Torch, and you're geeking out to Gear Gods. Hey, I'm John from Torch, and I'm going to show you guys our rigs. Okay, so here we have uh, my pedal board. Um, pretty simple. Uh, I try to streamline as much as possible before hitting the road. On the record, you know, we'll use, or I end up using various pedals, Steve as well, but really try to condense it and make it something that's, you know, easy to travel with while achieving the same sounds and, uh, you know, staying true to the sound of the record. As you get older, maybe you don't want to drag everything you own onto a pedal board and take it around with you. So start off with, uh, this is just a, a company I have, uh, run in with a friend of mine, Gary Phillips, and we make a class A and class AB discrete pedals, heads, we have cabinets, um, boost pedals, overdrive, uh, even things that like uh, blur the line between overdrive, fuzz, and distortion and whatnot. But this is a Tetrafet. This is actually um, a uh, torch edition that we're gonna be doing uh, soon. And uh, basically, yeah, it's a class A discrete overdrive um, it also provides a shift switch that allows you to do full range or a tight, kind of like a, a gentle roll off, roll off for people that, um, you know, shred and are really high up in the neck and they can do with a little less low end. So like anything, it has level, bass, mid, highs, and gain. Again, the shift, you know, gentle roll off. And uh, it really uh, lets the voice of an instrument through it's uh, the Class A discrete build is really something that embellishes anything you put through your signal chain and really retains the character of your playing uh, of, you know, an array of instruments you might want to plug into it. You actually hear the sound of your instrument while getting up to 90 dB of gain. And it's also uh, very low noise, which is something a lot of people have been picking up on, and that's just one of our designs. I'm not necessarily a fan of gates, but I do feel that you should be able to choose whether or not you want, like, you know, feedback or you want a real tight stop or whatnot without having to use a tuner, let's say. So um, that's the first thing in my chain. Next thing, the tried and true boss. I feel like the TU3 is pretty solid. I like that it does the, um, when you're in tune, you know, it's you get the clap there, you know, both sides. It's uh, pretty steady and all that. And I feel it tracks well. We don't necessarily rely on it 100% for our low A because it just never really tracks that, you know, like super well. But, you know, we do the, the higher strings and then by ear, since we use an octave tuning, we just kind of try to do that as quick as possible before playing. Then, out of there, we go into this um, True Bypass FX loop switcher that we made right before this trip. Gary was nice enough to throw it together for me, and it's real simple. Um, I like to keep my sound as uh, clear and true to my instrument going to my amp uh, when playing or recording if I'm not using effects. Now, when it's time for effects, you can like kind of pre-game a bit, turn on whatever you need, and boom, turn on for the part, and then exit to your liking. The effects loop, uh, I've actually reconfigured it a few times. And although maybe there's some ideal ways to run things, I've tried to do the educated um, layout, but I kind of like what I was getting in the past on the previous tour, which might not be the correct way on paper, let's say, but it would just, I feel like it really hugs the strings and what I'm doing. And it, I just feel like intact and like, even the stuff that on the record, I'm doing a bunch of stuff with the Chambar. And I feel like it just grips it more. There's more detail in it and it's very, it's much more sensitive in a good way. So the effects loop back to that, it goes, swings around here under the board and it goes to our uh, class A discrete clean boost pedal. And this pedal, just like the um, overdrive here has the full bandwidth or a high pass. Again, if you want to shred and you want to trim off those lows, for me, I keep them up. I like the full bandwidth. And it's up to 30 dB of clean, classy, discrete boost. And this thing is really useful. If I were to put it at the end of the chain, it would, you know, react with the amp in a totally different way. And I've had people plug these guys into 
vintage amps like high watts and stuff and they get this crazy overdrive but it's so low noise and so punchy and rich that it's like ex it expands the sound as much as it glues it together like a nice compressor but it's so open it almost provides headroom and this depth and fidelity um, due to the circuit design and all the circuits are you know unique start on the breadboard and and build according to what we feel we need so there's no like you know circuit recycling or any of that um, we just want to do unique circuitry um, we're both two touring musicians two recording engineers and we have although we have really different like palettes for music we do appreciate a good amount of uh, stuff that overlaps but our differences i think are really um really it's like a profound strength in a way because this stuff isn't aimed at being a high gain or low gain or and it's like whatever any player needs you should be able to use this stuff it's they're all tools and you should be able to throw this into the mix and get rolling and you know you know hopefully improve and uh, get the voice and sound that you've been searching for so this just gives me an extra dirge. I push this stuff. Some people might not be down with that. Some people might just say, yeah, why don't you just crank that thing further? But uh, for me, it just kind of, the way it all interacts, it works. So I just roll with it like this. Um, next up is the MXR Phase 95, which surprisingly great pedal in a small package. And it gives me exactly what I need for uh, certain parts. So use it on the new record and uh, some of the old stuff too. Um, pretty simple. I like this setting. I'm not sure. Which one is which? Maybe someone out there knows. And uh, I've messed with all the variations, but this is what works for me. Um, it's cool. It's a lot of little, you know, settings you can go between. And uh, yeah, I'm really grateful that those guys are, you know, working with us. The Dunlop guys are outstanding. They're they're great people all around. So then that feeds into the um, Jamie's Arpanoid here, the Earthquaker Devices Arpanoid, and I love this thing for leads you know, doing certain tricks in the studio, but live, you know, having it in for the leads and stuff, it just creates this depth. And I'm definitely using this thing like really like a caveman. It's like, I have it to the most simple setting where it doesn't do any of the um, arpeggiation or, or uh, you know, the scales it does or whatever. I just have it set so that it's uh, tracking. And I mean, this is actually a little higher today. Some days, you know, I'll switch it up according to the room, but typically I want to say, these are like just about off, right in the center. Some of the wet for that nice low end and uh, the dry right around like one o'clock, straight down. And it just, you know, I don't know if it's a Mutron or whatever, but it's just like almost like an octave fuzz or certain, you know, maybe a Mutron pedal that just gives you this like envelope filter slash subby, almost like a whammy, but it sounds more organic to me. And if you turn it up, it just sounds like a burly, overdriven organ, which is pretty killer in my book. So this was used heavily on uh, the closer on admission. And for any of the leads and stuff, I'm pretty sure it was on like 90% of the stuff. And I just really enjoy it. It's cool. Makes your guitar, can make your guitar sound like not a guitar, which I'm a huge fan of that. Next up is the Catlin Bread Echo Rec. This is my always on delay. And uh, again, using it very simple. I believe I'm at like quarter notes or whatnot. And uh, I, now on this tour, I'm trying the, I put, a, it has trimmable pots and a couple switches inside. So I cranked up the output gain a little bit uh, and I'm digging it. It uh, has this like nice dreamy wash, especially with the swell. It's like this oh, behind the um, delays and stuff. And I don't know, it works great. I always have that pedal on. It just gives you this little extra shimmer uh, and a little bit of wash, but the delays are tight, if that makes any sense. It's almost like a, a forward sound and then like a background kind of, uh, I don't know, ethereal sound or texture. So after that, we go up here to another one of Jamie's pedals, which is the Avalanche Run by Earthquaker Devices. And this actually saves me at least two to three spots on the board. This is about as big as I'd like to go. And this gives me the reverb slash delay combination. And again, like I really haven't gone, I haven't gone too deep with it while recording. I would just play a little bit and like just mess around with all the settings. And this is kind of where I landed uh, on recreating what I was doing on the record with maybe like um, a reverse reverb 
a del and then another delay, I'm able to get that sound between these two here. So it's been pretty fantastic. And sometimes I'll just turn this guy off and I'll run here. But for the most part, I've been leaving them both on and uh, just letting it be a little dreamier these days. This loops out into my trusty DL8 from Hardwire. I don't think these are in production anymore, but they are fantastic and it should be set down here to loop. Um, these are like super fantastic, simple pedals that are really efficient um, in the sense that they're, you can trust them. They're really hardy, um, simple layouts, which I'm a fan of and, you know, fairly intuitive um, controls. And uh, yeah, I've done like things on my own time where um, if I do like an improv, you know, noise set or some experimental stuff, I've even had two or three of these set up going to different amps and you can just, I like the way you can stack layers. It, it, re it holds and retains the dynamics of the layers really well. And uh, you know, that loops around back into the switcher and I can take it in and out easily, you know, from a uh, rhythm part into like a lead or a noisy part and then back without, you know, too much fuss and, you know, keeping the signal pure when I'm not using any of this, you know? And uh, the board has been handy. The right size, I would say for me personally, I didn't want to go any bigger. I like the fact that I can like use the Tetra Fet for dynamics and extra saturation and texture, um, you know, like a lift, both in body or a mid boost, um, more gain is cool, you know? I think most of us can have fun with that. And, you know, the rest is just controlled here. But uh, everything has its place. Everything does its own, you know, has its own role. It, it uh, its own character. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy with this now. And uh, we'll see. We'll see uh, what happens in the future. Up here in the center, we have Eric's board, which uh, has, again, the TU3. Really solid. Uh, with our bass tuning, it tracks all four strings just fine. And I think it's a fantastic mute button as well. That feeds right here into uh, another product that Gary and I came out with. It's the uh, Annex Bass Channel. And this is almost like two pedals in one. It's really versatile. And a lot of people are like, oh man, but does it only do like heavy gain or high gain? And is it fuzz, is it overdrive? It's like, like a lot of our stuff, depending on how you play and how you have the gain, the boost, and also, you know, for the guitar, it's the shift. Over here, it would be a combination of focus and shape, mainly focus. You can really blur the lines between overdrive, fuzz, distortion. So the way we have it set tonight is we got level. Well, let's just go through the controls. We got gain, boost, which is a large, large amount of gain split into two, two pots. It doesn't cascade, so you're not going to get that squishy you know, kind of almost like self-defeating effect, unless you just put so much distortion that that just naturally is gonna occur. But you can really dial in a sound with just a gain that's engaged by the on button, and then set the boost for a completely gentle lift, more grit, full-on distortion, or a loud, crushing, evilly saturated sound. And that's controlled by the loud switch level like any most pedals right, in these days. Uh, range is kind of our thing that we have going. The amps have uh, their own version of it. And it's kind of like an aggressive um, presence where you can honestly, let's say now he has new strings. So sometimes it'll go from being completely off, but you can turn this up to noon or further and you can actually get maybe like one to three extra shows worth of a new string sound. So it's like a, a presence with bite. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, perceived as like, oh, aggressive or, you know, any of that. But it does have a nice punch to it. You know, it's like a punchy presence, if you will. And then um, we got the bass, mids, trebles. We use our own uh, design for the EQs and they're very, uh, I would say very natural sounding, although you can get incred incredibly hyped, you know, sounds. Like if you scoop this thing and crank the treble or, you know, leave it around noon, bass to your liking you can go from like a super scooped metal sound or even kind of an svt sound out of a power amp or solid state amp and then you could turn the mids up to really warm it up and have it come forward in the mix 
without necessarily being brighter. Um, the base, I mean, we're at noon here. I've seen some people go as far as one. I mean, there's some people I can, I've seen them crank, but I, I'd be lying if I said most people aren't under noon, like in the negative, to be quite honest. So I'll set it back how you had it. And then, uh, so that's the base. Uh, for the focus, what this does is it allows you to introduce um, a gentle low end roll off before the preamp or leave it with some more. I'll leave it at that with some more. And uh, you can feel it. So if you, the way he has it right now, there's more low end before the preamp. It has a slight bit of like maybe like um, sponginess. You know, you hear more of the distorted sound and it's fatter for sure. And maybe you can even say like slightly, depending on how your EQ is positioned, you can get more of a vintage vibe with a focus in the up position. Now, if you drop it down, you have a gentle roll off in the low end before the preamp and you could, you know, add, add it back or add way more after that. But what that does, it, it actually lets you hear more of the strings, the coils, you know, more of that punch, like affiliated with, you know, I don't know, the infamous Jesus Lizard bass sound. And that's where this uh, switch comes in. Shape in the down position is asymmetrical clipping. And then the top is symmetrical clipping. Now, the best way I can describe um, asymmetrical clipping, it has more like more knuckles, it has more punch. And in the down position, I've had a lot of people in let's say like faster paced music or music where you really want the gritty, like kind of like the teeth of the tone to come out. Um, that's definitely a great combination. Now, if you want to warm it up a bit, you can just switch the focus up. If you don't necessarily want the upper mid, I don't know, the chest of the tone to re like kind of burst forward and punch through the mix, you can kind of do a uh, symmetrical, but um, I think this is how we had it and it really works for us. And I think most nights we'll set it up and then we'll see um, with our front of house, Ryan, we'll see like, hey, up or down. And usually it's always on par with what we feel is right for the room on stage. But uh, sometimes it's just, Let's say if you're playing in a club that has a ton of subs and your the stage is mounted like on top of the subs, or at least it feels like it is, you can easily just kind of like dial it back a little bit and then add it post preamp. But uh, it is a tighter sound, so sometimes that works. Um, then he has his uh, Boss Digital Delay, the DD3 for you know in between songs, ambient stuff, making some racket or noise loops in between songs or while tuning. Um, stuff like that. He, he's worked it into some songs where it's really cool where the bass stops playing for a second and he'll he'll do some ambient swell stuff or like even a quick kind of effect. This board works for him. It's a good size, travels well, and it's protected his stuff thus far. Okay, then over here, this is uh, Steve's board and he's keeping it simple as well. And uh, he's just running his Boss TU3. He'll use it to mute certain parts or whatnot. And then uh, we go over here and we got the MXR carbon copy. And he gets an awesome sound out of it. Uh, I really dig it, both recording and live. I kind of would like to mess with one, but I swear in the past when I mess with one, it's like, I don't get what he's getting out of it. But I kind of think that's a good thing because I'm using something different and it layers and kind of like they almost complement each other being different, you know, just different textures and tones are always a plus for, you know, stacking sounds in a mix. After the MXR carbon copy, we go over here and he has, I believe it, this is, this is the popular one. And I don't know if it's phase 60 or I don't, honestly, I don't know, but it's like the popular one and it, it sounds great. It kind of has a boost to it and some grit in my opinion. And it's kind of like he uses these together sometimes and it's kind of like a signature um, thing for him. But um, I really dig it. He's been using it on the beginning of uh, On The Wire Live, and I think it's cool for the solo. It kind of recreates um, a similar vibe that uh, was captured on the record. Those two together, he can do some you know, cool stuff, even though it's so simple, you know, and everyone sees delays and phasers on a lot of boards. But I really like what he gets. He almost gets this sort of, like, wash, ambient thing sometimes, and uh, it's cool. And it's just what he does, I guess. Next up, at the end of his chain on this side, is the Tetrafet. Again, one of our pedals, the Nunez Amps. And uh, let's see, his settings, the shift up. Uh, so he has a full range, level, 
about noon and he's using that into one of our Annex MK2 heads. And we both use the Tetrafet for extra gain, a bit of a volume jump, some grit, you know, and uh, just courses like a lift live, you know, kind of keep things dynamic or if we need some extra, I don't know, juice or something for solos. <laughs> mm extra armor or something, uh, it'll it'll make you feel right. Uh, his EQs are pretty flat here. It seems like everything's at one o'clock, so his highs, uh, mids, and bass are all pretty balanced, it looks like from my angle. The gain, he's using it, or that looks kind of like 11, maybe like 11 and a half. So he, he's definitely, you know, it's not a bad thing, but he's definitely a, more of a gain junkie than me, so he's always trying to you know, push it, but he makes it work. I'll say that. And uh, with his guitars, how he sets his uh, tone, it always sounds good to me. I mean, he's he's had a pretty good history with uh, unique sounds with his old band Floor, and then we definitely have done some dis different stuff, uh, different stuff from record to record over the years. And this this is, uh, I think, like this line is really able to let our sound breathe, and it's really been key to a certain clarity and letting the full range of our instruments come through. So it's exciting. And um, I mean, I actually, you know, I suggest like, hey, use it for chorus and loud parts, but I think if it was left up to him, I think he'd leave it on the whole time. <laughs> but yeah, so that's these boards, um, same type of board um, as Eric. It's um, all three boards are actually from Florida based company Gator. We use the um, Voodoo Labs Pedal Power 2 Plus, I think across the board. Mine is mounted and under, but I've had it for years. Um, our experience is that they're, you know, low noise and pretty sturdy. I've dropped mine more than I'd like to admit uh, pretty often. That's the pedal uh, rundown up front. You know, the live rig, so far we've seen the pedals, but everything before hitting the amps, we really wanted to recreate what we use on the record. And it needed to be true to the sound that, you know, was being developed, whether it was down in Florida in the shop with Gary, what we were you know doing pre-production with and accomplishing on that end so things were being tweaked throughout not only for our sound like this stuff isn't just you know designed for the torch sound i have a lot of different people picking them up and they're just designed to be versatile and like for a band like us we want that full range switching over from bass to guitar after years of dialing in a bass sound that you can feel that can it's like the actual What's coming out of the speakers is breathing. Once that was achieved, switching over to guitar, I, I just didn't, I wasn't, I thought I would be happy with just the stuff that was around, but it really didn't work out. Um, I just felt like, whoa, what's going on here? And luckily for me, uh, I got back to LA where I was living at the time and Sasha from Dunable invited me over and he's like, hey man, come on down. I have some guitars, uh, you should try them out. I'm like, sure. I'm like, I'm working on this amp. Maybe I can bring that too. And so we kind of like both showed each other what we were working on. And I mean, at that point he was established, had tons of gorgeous guitars out there. And uh, that felt right. From the second, you know, I played the Cyclops, which I can grab over here real quick. It was the sound and it was the right balance of uh, scale length, body weight, the comfort here on the, the heel or whatever it's called. The tummy, whatever, the belly, whatever. All the carbs in the right places, the right amount of pointy, the tone was great. Um, his pickups were fantastic. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Bill Lawrence, so I just popped in an L500L once, you know, it became clear that I needed this guitar. And this is a very special guitar to me. It, again, it's like the first thing that felt right um, after trying several guitars, to say the least. And um, yeah, it's been great. I do have this knob, it's in my bag. I'm really bad with knobs. And, uh, <laughs> but it, it's great. And you know, it's the sound, it's my sound on the record. And uh, lay down all the rhythms, a good amount of leads with it. And uh, yeah, the Cyclops is easily one of my favorite guitars. I, I'll never part with this thing. And uh, yeah, I think there's another one that we're doing with an awesome finish and pickguard combination. Um, the guitar that I've been playing on this tour as well, due to using my friend's GNL F100 on the record, because it had this really nice GNL bridge, um, is this Coons Custom. We called it, or we're calling it, the Maverick. It's a collaboration between myself and my friend Joe of Coons Custom Guitars, and it has a robot graves neck, a mastery bridge. My uh, favorite pickup, the L500L. 
And you know, it, it, it's a, a combination of all the guitars I used on the record combined into one uh, six string entity that uh, is playable live and I can achieve different things that were done on the record with the Dunable, some F Fender Starcaster or like other, the GNL F100, but the mastery is definitely great. Um, I feel it has a tone, it stays in tune fantastic. It looks great too, you know, but uh, it feels right from palm muting to like the bendy dreamy stuff. Um, even like just some like noisy racket, it's great. The neck gives me insane tone, depth, character, and it stays in tune fantastic. You can travel your mind at ease. It has a great balance, it's not neck heavy whatsoever. Um, the guitar process was great. Joe is so fun to work with. We actually, once the body was done before it was stained, we went ahead and uh, put down some paper and we literally, I drew the pick art on and he was, all about it and uh yeah it just has like the right amount of like the curves the pointiness the, and you know the classic kind of like a Masri vibe but different and uh it really again sums up what uh several guitars accomplished on the record this is my bomb string guitar it's a fender dual humbucker although i only use a bridge pickup this guitar stays in tune fantastically it has some locking fender tuners my good friend Bryce Wells that used to work at Fender um, was very kind and helped us and uh, helped me a lot when I switched over to guitar and I just in lack of the correct instruments for what the band calls for live and on record. So this guitar sounds very burly and season two fantastic, a nice blend of mids and twang and body and depth. I have a lace nitro hemi in there. It could be a little cleaner, but maybe I'll do that at the end of the tour. Um, the strings we use our Dunlops, we have custom gauge sets that uh, help us do our wacky tuning, um, whether it's the bomb string tuning or the regular octave tuning we use. This is uh, the bass that Eric's using, um, staying true to my tradition of not being able to hold on to knobs. And uh, we, I got a couple, or maybe just one at the house. Um, he's been using this, he's been ripping on it, he recorded with it. Also Dunlop strings. Um, I love this bass. It's uh, definitely the one. The torch sound, and I mean, I've had bands recorded me and all that, but it just feels right. The weight is perfect. It's not neck heavy. It is fantastic in the sense that uh, it stays in tune, travels well. You know, you're not gonna be worried about anything happening in that. But uh, once I got that bass, I never even like worried or thought I needed a backup or anything. Yeah, so those are the guitars. We have Steve's guitar over here. He has an EGC, but this one's handy right now. It's a JML Flying V. It's like a, an oversized V. Um, Dunlop strings, uh, kind of like a fender scale length. It really helps with our tuning. Uh, some really nice work here by uh, JML in details. There's actually, um, you know, uh, a lot of gorgeous wood that they use, and I believe it is a neck through. So it has a nice, you know, there you go. It's like kind of like old school BC Rich. But I just love the balance of it's like the floor symbol there. Um, just the neck through has like a certain weight and thickness and sustain that's fantastic. It get, balances well with the aluminum that we're using. Uh, it's just, I don't know, great craftsmanship from uh, a true music lover. And uh, all the, the contours and the stains and everything he does is just fucking fantastic. I believe these are uh, Gibson style pickups the type you'd find like in a Gibson Les Paul or so. Uh, we'll start with Steve's rig here. He has um, one of our Annex MK2s uh, and it's a quad voice dual channel all tube head. And each channel is actually its own head, its own point to point hand wired head. Channel one has some cool features where it's actually symmetrical clipping. Symmetrical clipping and you have a voice switch which allows you to do three settings of a very large amount of low end before the preamp. And as you go down to closer to position one from six, it gets tighter and it's cool. You can use that to really, really grip and project your tuning. Like it really, it's like a high pass filter or a low end expander 
uh, depending on if you go three up or, th or three down. And it really, really can just trim or add the little bit you need and it just really, your, your notes just burst out of the cabinet. Um, you have gainer boost, uh, like the base pedal, huge amount of gains, gain split into two pots. So you're not cascading and getting choked up and all that. When you do get into extremely high gain and if you put a high gain pickup and, you know, play hard, you can get some of that ducking, but um, yeah, you can, you just dime them and you can get that effect, but you can also get tons of gain and it's nice, open, lush, clear. Um, all the pots on the EQs on our amps are push pull. So you have two ranges. If they're in, the bandwidth uh, are independent. The EQ bands are independent. Now, if you take these out, they overlap a bit. And to me, my ear, the low end will drop an octave. To my ear, when you pull out the treble, it softens the tone a bit, but it expands at the same time. So if you have it in, you have like a tight, modern, edgier, you know, sharper, biting tone, you know, depending on your gain and how you're playing. But if you pull it back, you can get a nice, warmer tone that is clear and cuts just as much as, as, as if they were in. But it's, it's just, you can, it's a quick, kind of jump between modern, vintage, aggressive, in different ways. Um, and so the voice is for channel one. Uh, then we go to channel two, which is asymmetrical clipping. So it's a bit gnarlier by nature. And again, a huge amount of gain split into two pots. You got the push pull again. For our sound, we're definitely pulling these out and kind of like rounding out the sound a bit. And then bass in on both sides to keep it tight and you can play we play out of both channels at the same time so we're playing out of two heads at once it's completely in phase no weird comb filtering none of that stuff um just you know shaping galore and stacking you know two heads in phase no ground loops none of that stuff so real low noise circuit as well it's something that a lot of people have been catching up on and recording the record i wouldn't even have to edit stuff i'm like yeah that's cool moving on um, the range here, again, it's similar to the bass pedal as well. It's like a punchy, energetic, yet aggressive um, presence. He's using, you know, a little bit there um, to kind of like get a little more of that uh, energy, if you will. And uh, it's 130 watts, just class A, B, discreet. We got the cabinets, the 412s. Um, they have very specific dimensions, internal baffling, and just all these little things that I kind of like was making notes of throughout the year. And it kind of materializes to these cabinets that are really just not harsh or super beamy or directional. Over here we have the newest cabs. Um, we've done 30 plus, we have shit, closer to 40 days with them and it's a 410, 115. These took, you know, I wasn't ready to put out bass cabs till I got exactly what I wish I had when I played bass and also as a recording engineer, what I felt like should be available, um, both in clarity, depth, tightness, um, staying in, sonically staying intact when cranked and pushed with like heavy sounds or just, you know, frequency demanding tones, whether it's depth or like low mid, sub, low end, high end. It should be really shapeable and not harsh, not fatiguing, um, and just, you know, smooth to listen to no matter how aggressive, like it shouldn't be shrill and, you know, tire you out. So these, these will be up maybe at, at the end of this tour. I'm really happy with the high grade speakers we're using in there, we're using very specific eminence. Uh, we use my old SVT, it's a Magnavox era. Uh, I believe it's mid seventies. Uh, we're running like KT88s back there, I believe. And, you know, we, put, we uh, you know, run the signal from the pedal board right in there jump the channels and just uh, set it all in a way that works for the room that we're playing that night. And just like the heads, we use two different, you know, levels to really balance out. This is more of like the high end, silky high end with a real throwy mid range, but voice relative, well, 800 is not, seems a lot higher than its voice, but it really translates uh, like nice and deep um, while still having good mids to pop through the mix. The low, stuff like sub, like reggae dub vibe like really down there and then this is almost like the mid-range you know like kind of like real pop 
punchy, almost like a sun type sound or something. It has more of that honk, you know? So that, those two, this one's more of like, has that dip and this one comes right in the middle. So it kind of like, whoop, fits great together. Over here we have my um, Annex MK2. Same deal, two class A, B discrete channels, 130 watts, both channels used together. On mine, I'm doing something a little different. I might be letting a little more low end through pre preamp on channel one. I've pulled out mids and treble um, to kind of like, you know, soften that modern edge or whatnot, using less gain. The new ones definitely have more gain. Uh, that's actually number one. This is by now like number eight or something. And uh, we've since then, like, the leads inside and the cable runs have all been established. So the sound of this amp is a bit more forward and uh, articulate. So you can see the settings are a little different for me and my needs. Um, barely any boost at all. Um, huge amount of gain split into two pots, both channels, symmetrical clipping, asymmetrical clipping, mu uh, much less range on mine. Pulled out the treble and the mids on mine. You can see like these are pretty powerful. Like the levels are really give or take somewhere between there and like maybe here playing live. It's a lot on tap. For the cabinets, we have the 412 VLs, and they are very, very effective in our tone, where it's like we need something thick and articulate, yet, you know, really not directional and just really uh, musical, you know, not fatiguing and harsh and scratchy and all that. Uh, maybe in the future, stereo rigs with like a 212 or something, but for right now, this is enough stuff to carry around. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's our our rig, that's our, our individual rigs and our, our back line uh, while we're on tour supporting admission. This is it, this is our sound. This is uh, what, we, what we've been using and what uh, I've been working on with uh, my partner Gary Phillips for Nunez Amps and a lot of other great products by other companies doing wonderful things. You can find out more information about Nunez Amps at nunezamps.com. We also have on Instagram and there's a YouTube channel as well. People can find the record, I mean, all streaming services, great record stores like Amoeba, which we're in right now. And, uh, you know, check your, your local record store, man. Support the hell out of them.